True Gay Crime contains coarse language, adult themes, and content that is violent and disturbing. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to TGC, True Gay Crime. I'm Patrick, your host. So the sources I used for Kevin Lee Graff are uh, an article on BBC News uh, online, an Associated Press article from cbsnews.com, um, a blog post by David Frazier. I used findadeath.com, which was really interesting because you get to see a lot of the photos of the murder house. And uh, losangelestimes.com has an article by Tiffany Sue and Andrew Blankstein. Enjoy the maiden episode of True Gay Crime. And in this episode, we are going to look at the heinous and graphic story of Kevin Lee Graff. On a personal note, I decided to start with this story in particular because I have a personal connection with the events, let's say. Um, As I go through the story, I'll be putting in my personal details of how or where I fit into this story. But but before I start, I did want to say how shocked I was when, when doing research, all of these murderers and serial killers and rapists... They all have three names. I don't get it. Kevin Lee Graff. It's shocking how many of them actually have three names. I don't know if it's a curse of people with three names or when you have or go by three names, you're suddenly destined to become a serial killer. I don't know. So without further ado, here is the graphic and heinous story of Kevin Lee Graff. Kevin Lee Graff was a 27-year-old from rural Oregon. Former neighbors said Graff had a solid upbringing, living with his father, Steve, despite his parents' divorce at a young age. He was one of the best kids growing up here, said Dan Huxell, who still lives in Graff's hometown of Irrigan. First of all, there's two things going on here. First of all, Dan, one of the best kids growing up, he grew up to kill people, so you're not a very good judge of character, clearly. And also, the hometown is called Irrigan. So he's from Irrigan, Oregon? I mean, that's enough to drive you nuts anyway. So Dan, the neighbor, says he was clean cut and stayed out of trouble. Yeah, not for long. Okay. As a teenager, Kevin's family noticed very peculiar behaviors and became very concerned about his mental well-being. He became erratic and impulsive, often lashing out seemingly for no reason. Not a good sign. Kevin joined the Marines shortly after high school to get out of Oregon. Yeah, obviously, to get out of Oregon, Oregon, to be precise. He was stationed at Camp Pendleton in San Diego, that's hot, but was released on a medical discharge for an injured ankle. Now, we don't know how that injured ankle happened, but we can only take, we can only have our best guesses. He probably did it to himself, okay. His mental health issues continued to worsen, and Kevin's family hoped that treatment at the Department of Veteran Affairs in Long Beach which is a federal agency that provides health care services to eligible military veterans, would help him. But it did not, and he was released after 10 days. He was diagnosed as a manic depressive and had a complete nervous breakdown. Now, that's his half-brother, Jacob, that said that in a phone interview. So it's kind of concerning that the Department of Veteran Affairs in Long Beach was not able to diagnose somebody as manic depressive or notice that they had a nervous breakdown. So we have to remember... That this is back in 2000, well, the early 2000s, right? The late late 90s, early 2000s at this point when he was uh, at Camp Pendleton. And so they weren't talking about mental health issues like we do today. You know, this it wasn't part of the zeitgeist. Uh, people weren't addressing it. People weren't being diagnosed properly or being taken care of. And even at the highest level. I mean, this is the Department of Veteran Affairs in Long Beach. And they weren't able to recognize Kevin's needs properly and give him the care that he needed. And really, this become this is just the start of the beginning of the end for everything. So had Kevin been receiving the treatment that he needed, this story might have ended very differently. All right. Everyone in the family was trying to help him. We tried getting him institutionalized. This is the half-brother of Jacob talking. 
But everyone was telling us the authorities wouldn't do anything about it unless he was a threat to himself or others. Okay, again, a little foreshadowing there. I think the Marines changed him, Jacob said. He was never the same after he got out. We tried to get him committed, but the metal, the mental health people, the police, no one would listen. So, again, Jacob, it's easy to recognize after the fact. I mean, hindsight is twenty twenty. so I don't know how much, how much they really did try to get Kevin help, um, or how much he's just saying, look, we tried to get him help, but no one would help. Who knows what the truth is here, but apparently they did try to get Kevin help. Period. Okay. Unable to get the help he needed, Kevin continued to wander through Southern California. So at this point, he leaves the Marines. He's trying to get help. Nothing is working. So now he becomes a bit of a drifter. And he's just traveling around Southern California. He's in Orange County for a while. And just Southern California. And he ends up in Las Vegas, where he's arrested on suspicion of lewd behavior after exposing himself to a woman, officials say. I love suspicion of lewd behavior. Like, <laughs> they're suspicious that he did it or he did do it. Like, it's kind of cut and dry. Like, either you showed your dick to someone or you didn't. Like, <laughs> we suspect that you showed your cock to this lady. But then why are you arresting me if it's a suspicion? I'm not a cop, so I don't know. If somebody knows what that's all about, let me know. Um, he later pleaded guilty for disorderly conduct. So obviously he did do something. Um, Kevin eventually ends up back in San Diego. Okay, so now he's traveled around, he's gone to Las Vegas, he's, he ends up back in San Diego, because it's familiar territory, where his good looks get him the attention of the gay community in Hillcrest. So now, Kevin Lee Graff has landed in the center of gay San Diego. He befriends some guys, and they suggest that he could make money, because of course Kevin doesn't have a job right now, he's looking to make some cash, they suggest that he can make money as a go-go boy in the gay bars there. So what does he do? He goes to the bars. He auditions, and he gets work, and he becomes a fixture of these bars. Uh, the problem is, Kevin was gay for pay, which means he liked women, but worked to the clubs for the money, and even dabbled as an escort. All right, so we need to talk about this right now. Being gay for pay doesn't mean the person is straight, and they're just doing gay things for money. Somebody who is 100% on the straight side of the spectrum, it doesn't matter how much money you would give them. And by the way, I was a go-go boy in West Hollywood. The money's good, but you wouldn't change your sexuality for it. It's not that good, okay? So he was, Kevin, it's safe to say Kevin Lee Graff is on the spectrum somewhere, okay? Enough that he was able to get something out of becoming a go-go boy, and even an escort. The problem is, when you identify as gay for pay, that you're suppressing your homosexual tendencies, and you're not mm, allowing yourself to accept your full and true self. Let's remember, this guy was from Oregon, Oregon, right? I mean, this is small town, bumfuck nowhere. I'm sure... Being gay in Oregon, Oregon, is not, uh, you know, celebrated, let's say. So somewhere he's on the spectrum. He's growing up. He has some gay feelings. He's never able to access them or accept them. He has mental health issues, as we've already discussed. And now he's go-go dancing and escorting down in San Diego, saying that he actually likes women. And he's only doing this for the pay. And now he's being introduced to drugs not a good combination. So, the drugs obviously were able to numb him enough to perform on the stage and in bed with men as an escort. He became a fixture of the party boy scene in Hillcrest, in the bars, in the parties, and he was even featured on a 2002 cover of the now defunct uh, Gay and Lesbian Times out of San Diego. In 2003, at the zoo party, one of the many week weekend-long gay pride events, which are host hosted in San Diego, uh, which is, and this one is hosted at the San Diego Zoo, hence the name Zoo Party. Kevin performed as a featured go-go boy entertaining the crowds. Now, 
This is where it gets personal for me. Enter Patrick Moreno. <laughs> now, I had moved to Los Angeles in 2000 uh, and started, oh, I was already a party boy at that point, but uh, I was living in Los Angeles and I really got into the party scene. So, I mean, I was going to white party, winter party, pink party, black party, purple party, you know, turquoise party, you know, striped party, plaid party. I was at all the parties, all right? I was doing the drugs, dancing the dance, loving the life, all right? So in 2003, in San Diego, at the zoo party, I was fucking there. I went to this party. I was at the same circuit party as Kevin Lee Graff. Let that sink in for a second. So, here's the thing. I was so high, and I was having the time of my life, which is great, but it means I don't remember if I made eye contact with Kevin Lee Graff. I'm trying to access the memories, and it's not happening. I have flashes of light, music, friends, you know, animal costumes, and the like. But I can't remember for the life of me if actually I had seen Kevin Lee Graff at any moment during the night. So all that to say, I basically am rubbing shoulders with a future killer and didn't know. Nobody knew at that time. Okay, so it places me at the scene anyway. Now, fast forward a little bit. Shortly after this time, Kevin makes a move north through Huntington Beach, California. So now he's moving up the coast. And he eventually ends up in Los Angeles, as we all do, settling near 3rd and La Brea temporarily. But of course, as I mentioned before, Kevin had become a drifter at this point with no real fixed address, staying with friends, you know, hooking up with people, staying at their place and just couch surfing, basically, and living on the street for some of it as well. So on the morning of Sunday, June 13th, 2004, Kevin Lee Graff found himself outside the home of Robert Lee's on Courtney Avenue in Hollywood, California. Okay, little side note. Before the, this incident happened with Kevin Lee Graff, the most notorious thing to happen in the neighborhood was actor Hugh Grant being arrested in a car with a prostitute. So that was like the huge scandal of this neighborhood. Personal note, again, you will not fucking believe this. In 2004... During this time, I lived in that neighborhood. So, we are talking, just to give you a little mind map, murder mind map here, all right? Robert Lee's, which is the the scene of the first crime, had a little white bungalow-style house on Courtney Avenue. Courtney Avenue is a street that runs north-south, and then, so crossing it on the south is Sunset Boulevard, And to the north is Hollywood Boulevard, okay? Just south of Sunset Boulevard and two blocks over is North Sierra Bonita Avenue. I lived at North Sierra Bonita Avenue on the corner of DeLongpre. Two blocks over and just across Sunset Boulevard is basically a five-minute walk to Robert Lee's house. We have to wonder also... So that's my personal... Can you fucking believe how close... I mean, like, what the fuck is going on? We have to wonder now, how does Kevin Lee Graff find himself specifically on the front lawn of Robert Lee's little cottage on Courtney Avenue? So there's a few theories about this. Um, Nothing is ever really, you know... No concrete reason is really given. The police have investigated and they can't. They just say it's coincidence that he's set up there. Local lore has sort of speculated, and this is not, this is just alleged. This has no real base in fact at all. But when people heard about what happened there, they assumed that because um, Kevin Lee Graff was working as an escort that these victims had hired him at some point and he went back to get get some kind of revenge either because he was high on drugs and he just snapped and he blamed them for whatever he didn't like the way they treated him uh 
whatever it was, maybe it, there, um, the encounter had gone bad and they had kicked him out, whatever. But there was a lot of circulating theories about that. But when I've done, I did my research, both victims were either, they were either married or had a girlfriend, which we know doesn't mean diddly shit. They could obviously have been hiring gay escorts on the side, especially since both men were older. So they were from a generation where, yeah, of course you had a girlfriend or of course you were married. And then you did all that crazy shit on the side, right? Again, just a theory, but we have to wonder, how does Kevin Lee Graff end up on that specific property on that morning? So let's learn a little bit about Robert Lees to set the scene. Robert Lees, which is victim number one, was born in San Diego in 1912. 19 fucking 12. That's the year the Titanic sank. This is how old this guy was. Can you believe it? You made it to 91. Okay. He moved to Hollywood and started his career in the 30s as an aspiring actor-dancer. But his career in acting eventually sort of hit a roadblock, and Robert instead turned to writing. Fast forward now to the 50s and the McCarthy era, which was witness to the war on communism. So the House Un-American Activities Committee zeroed in on Robert on April 10th, 1951, when he was named as a member of the Communist Party of America, which he was a member of the Communist Party, which he joined in 1939. When Robert was called to testify in 1952, he pleaded the fifth, which means he didn't want to say anything about it. They were asking him to give them more names, because if you named people, it would make your life easier. But he was such a stand-up guy that he was like, fuck you, I'm not naming anyone, I'm a fucking communist eat my dick. So he was blacklisted from Hollywood, poor guy, um, which basically meant that nobody would hire you because they would be afraid of being guilty by association. So if somebody would hire you, um, people would assume that you were a communist too. So if you were blacklisted, you were basically fucked and you were out of work for a while. There was one way around it though, and Robert discovered what it was, and it was to write under a pseudonym. So he chose J.E. Selby. And he went on to write and write, and he was so successful. He's best known as a comedy writer for Abbott and Costello. He wrote a bunch for Alfred Hitchcock, um, the TV show. And most famously, probably, is the Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis vehicle, Jumping Jacks, which was a major success for Paramount Studios. It was only much later in his life that he was recognized for his huge Hollywood contributions under his rightful name of Robert Lees. He wrote all the way up until the early 1980s. His wife, Jean, passed away from cancer in 1982, and he retired from writing in 1983. Now, you have to listen to this. You won't fucking believe this. On the day he was murdered, the day... He was murdered. I had to say it twice so that you really understood. He was going to a ceremony in Beverly Hills recognizing his lifelong achievements in film. Let me say it again. On the day he was murdered, he was going to a ceremony in Beverly Hills recognizing his lifelong achievements in film. What the fuck? Okay. So, <clears throat> here we go. This is where it gets graphic. Ready? Ready? Lees, as I mentioned before, lived on a small cottage on a quiet street line, a uh, tree lined street in Hollywood. All right, so picture something really cute and picturesque and neighborly. The morning of Sunday, June 13th, 2004, at 11 a.m., Kevin Lee Graff wandered into the yard of the unsuspecting Robert Lees. Graff entered the house through an unlocked door and started exploring the rooms of the house. He startled the 91-year-old Lees in his bedroom. Lees, obviously being 91, Kevin Lee Graff being 27, Lees had no chance at all to overtake uh, Graff. So Lees was murdered in his bedroom. Now, he was bludgeoned to death uh, with a knife. Now, it, they weren't specific as to where the knife came from if Kevin 
showed up with the knife or if he grabbed it from the kitchen. But basically, Kevin Lee Graff murders Robert Lees in his bedroom. But, 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 murdering the poor old man wasn't enough for Kevin Lee Graff. No, he wasn't done. Things are about to get super graphic. So if you have a weak stomach, you might want to fast forward a little bit. Okay. Once dead, Graff then worked at cutting off Robert's head from his body and removing some of his organs. He cut off his head and removed some. That means, I mean, I don't know what kind of knife he had, but he had to saw away at this man's neck until the head came off of the body. And he removed some of his organs. Okay. He then proceeded to cut out one of Lee's eyes and using some sort of tool, he dug out the brain matter from the cavity. He then took off his belt. He slid one end through the empty eye socket and he pushed it through the severed head until the end came out the neck. His work complete. Graf then found some towels and covers up the body, which kind of tells me like, not that he regretted it, but he saw the me- He was lucid enough that he saw the mess and he was kind of covering it, which I think is a really interesting detail. He left Mr. Lee's headless corpse on the floor of his bedroom and he headed out the back door and he hopped the fence. This is where the story just gets even more nuts. He goes out the back and hops the fence while carrying the severed head of the 91-year-old Robert Lees. Graf is now found is now finding himself on the property of 69-year-old retired Dr. Morley Engelson on North Stanley Avenue, Hollywood. Okay, just to murder mind map this for you, North Stanley Avenue runs parallel to Courtney Avenue. So he's gone out the back and jumped the fence, and now he's in Dr. Morley Engelson's backyard. Dr. Morley Engelson, who was once captain of the Fairfax High School football team, was alone in his home and had been booking a plane ticket on Southwest Airlines to San Jose for business by telephone when Graf entered the house using the front door and carrying Mr. Lee's severed head. So he went around the house and decides to go in the front door. I don't know. That's a strange choice. Wouldn't you just go in the back door? The Southwest Airlines sales operator heard screams and a struggle as Mr. Engelson was surprised in his home. Not knowing what exactly was going on, the agent called the Los Angeles Police Department and sent them to the address. Can you imagine you're on the phone with somebody and you can hear them basically being butchered? I mean, it was so graphic, they, they didn't know exactly what was going on, but they knew it was enough to call the LAPD. That's intense. Before the police arrived, Graf had time to grab Engelson's kitchen knives and mutilate the body of the 67-year-old retired doctor. This time, though, he left the head attached, which is nice, but instead pulled the pants off the corpse and severed the penis from the body. So this kind of goes to that whole theory. It seems like a very specific thing to do. It's a very emasculating thing to do, and it's something that somebody who had mental health issues and was extremely high on drugs and had all this internalized homophobia would do. So it kind of lends itself to that whole theory and again not knowing if these people were had hired kevin as an escort or not there's no proof of that of course but obviously kevin doing that is a reflection of how he felt inside regardless graf then entered the doctor's bedroom and neatly placed the severed head of mr lee's on the bed a gruesome greeting for whoever would find it With the two men well and truly dead, Graf left the house by the front door, but not before swiping Mr. Engelson's car keys and stealing his Mercedes-Benz. Jesus. Can you imagine if you had seen him walking in the front door the first time, carrying the head? I mean, 
clearly nobody was out for a walk. Imagine you're just walking your dog and you see this guy carry. You wouldn't even you wouldn't even be able to process it. You'd be. I don't even know. Would you would you know it's real? Would you think it was a prop? I mean, it's Hollywood. I don't know. Anyway. Arriving officers spotted Mr. Engelson's body through a front window and forced their way inside. Which I find bizarre. The the cops had to force their way inside, but Kevin just walks in. So does that mean Kevin locked the door when he left? It's very thoughtful. Officers verified that Engelson was dead from multiple stab wounds and had a fireplace poker sticking out of his neck. He was found by the front door, pants around his ankles, penis chopped off. In the rear of the home, they found Lee's severed head on the bed where Graf had left it. While examining the scene, investigators received a call from the Los Angeles Fire Department reporting that they had responded to a call at a neighboring house belonging to Robert Lee's. It was while the police were at Engelson's house on Stanley Avenue that Robert Lee's longtime girlfriend, Helen Colton, 86 years old, arrived to pick him up for the event at the Academy headquarters in Beverly Hills. Jesus Christ. Imagine. She was all decked out, ready to go. So she, you're his girlfriend. You've been you're excited. You've been getting ready all day. Your hair is done. Your makeup's done. You're going to the Academy headquarters in Beverly Hills because your boyfriend, 91-year-old Robert Lees, is being celebrated for his work in the cinematic arts. You go to the front door and knock. There's no answer. So you creep around the side of the house and you peer in the bedroom window only to discover that your boyfriend's bloody and headless corpse is covered in towels. What the fuck? Like, what you thought was going to be one of the best nights of your life has just turned into the worst day of your life. That's obviously when she called the police. So Helen is quoted as saying, It was unreal, obviously, but I couldn't believe it, she said. I was befuddled for a moment. It was like a movie, not real life. And I think that's what happens when something is so traumatic and it's right in front of your face. And that's why I was wondering, you know, when Kevin was going into Dr. Engelson's house holding the head, if somebody had seen that, I don't know where you would put that in your brain. You would just assume it's not real, right? It's too much. And I love that Helen uses the word befuddled. Like, she's such an 86-year-old woman, befuddled. Who says that? Anyway, all right. Uh, little side note, also. The stolen Mercedes belonging to Mr. Engelson was found a few hours later near where they later discovered Graf was temporarily living. And Graf had also ditched a pair of shoes he was wearing and thrown them into a garbage dumpster. Okay, so now on to the next part of the story, which starts on Tuesday, June 15th, 2004. Two days after the murders had happened, okay? Kevin is now found outside the famous gates of the Paramount Studios lot. The studio is only two miles from the homes of Engelson and Lee's, and a one Mr. Patrick Morano. That's me. So crazy. Graf approached the security guards and asked for the phone number of a female employee. Now, it's never really shared if he knew who this female employee was, if he was giving some random name, or if he actually knew somebody who worked there. Don't know. But he went there and he was asking for it. Obviously, they refused. Um, because he was acting very weird and he starts walking towards the street and he starts talking and gesturing really loudly to himself and he starts flipping off cars as they drive by and doing obscene gestures. And because of this erratic behavior, the guards, they obviously, they keep their eye on him because this is property that they need to protect. Okay. There's important people at Paramount Studios. So... The guard, Isaac Maceus, later said something didn't feel right. Wow. There's a good judge of character. 
The way he was behaving, we kept the surveillance camera trained on him, Security Sergeant Craig Phillips said. Due to the double murder, there was now a massive manhunt, which led to a televised news conference where police showed a photograph of Kevin Lee Graff. The security guard, Phillips, who was watching the news at the time, he saw the conference on the office TV and he recognized Graff immediately. I turned to the camera on my monitor. I said, that's him. That's him, Phillips said. The police show up minutes later and Graff is arrested without incident, where he was found sitting on a wall under a row of ficus trees near Melrose Avenue, carrying a Bible and a small can of mace. So weird. What the fuck? Where did you get the Bible? Why do crazy people always carry either Catcher in the Rye or the Bible? What is it? I shouldn't call him crazy people. He has mental health issues. That's not his fault. But also, where did you get a small can of mace? Who carries mace except women to fend off men in attacks? Which makes me think, dear God, what happened in the two days between the double murder and you were found at the Paramount Studios gate? Did you attack a woman? God, I hope not. So that's how he was found. At the time of his arrest, police did not find a weapon on Graf. Well, just the mace. It's too early in the investigation to understand why those two particular houses, those two particular people were chosen, if they were chosen at all, the police said. During questioning, Graf admitted he was high on methamphetamines and ecstasy and said he had no memory of the murders, saying, quote, If I did this, man, I just want to say I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I know saying sorry isn't enough. It isn't going to do nothing. But I'm no criminal, dude. I'm a really good kid. I don't know how all this happened. They should probably talk to his neighbor back in Oregon, Oregon, Oregon. And he'll he'll be a good character witness saying he was a great kid growing up. You know, he didn't do nothing. He's no criminal, dude. They said, he said, I'm no criminal dude. I'm a really good kid. I mean, that's not really self-aware though, is it? I mean, probably you're not a really good kid. Like maybe you're, you don't think, you don't remember about the murders, but you probably know that you have, you know, thoughts about things and you've treated people not nicely, you know, and you're not really a kid. Like you're 27. You're an adult now. So there's that. Okay. Okay. Graf escaped a possible death penalty by pleading guilty on February 26th, 2008 to two counts of first-degree murder, along with eight other charges, including torture, mayhem, and burglary. Graf's attorney had argued that Graf suffered from a severe mental illness, duh, consistent with bipolar disorder with psychotic features of schizoaffective disorder. So at least that came out. In April 2008, he was sentenced to two life terms without the possibility of parole. Thank God. The victim, Robert Lee's son, Richard, 63, who opposes the death penalty, said he was satisfied with with Graf's guilty plea on principle, but he still misses his father terribly, he said through tears. He said, quote, he was a very dear man who had suffered enough in his life and over such huge issues. Richard Lee said, I just wanted him to have a wonderful old age with great friends. Can you imagine you make it all the way to fucking 91? You live through the McCarthy. You're like blacklisted in Hollywood as a communist. And you get all the way to 91. And this is how it ends for you? Some 27-year-old punk with mental health issues on drugs? I mean, just not. what. And, and again, and again, how did he end up on his lawn? Why his lawn why that day why his house um richard lees which is the son again said he feared that if he saw graf face to face he would kill him on sight or rip him to shreds so he does not plan to attend the april sentencing yeah that's probably for the best there's no closure for something like this he said i think it's a fleeting experience but the loss is forever and you don't get over it ever 
That is 100% true. Dr. Engelson's widow, Valerie London, said, although it took a lot longer than I would have liked to get to this point, which was agony for me and my family, now I truly feel that my husband can rest in peace because this was resolved in a way he would approve of. As of January 2014, Graf is incarcerated at Mule Creek State Prison in Ione, California. And so ends the horrifying story of Kevin Lee Graf. Wow. So, obviously, this story is not only gruesome, but has that personal angle for me, having been so close to the murder scene when it happened, and even being at a party that Kevin Lee Graf was go-go dancing at. I mean, I was living in Hollywood at that time, and, I mean mingling in circles that he was also present at. So the chances of me ever having met him or, you know, knowing somebody who knew him. I mean, the fact that we never met face to face is a little shocking. You know, maybe I'm thinking by that point he had been mostly homeless. Um, so he had slipped you know, into the, that gray, dark area that people fall into when they have mental health issues that are not going treated and, and they start doing drugs and, and stuff like that. So I guess by that point, he had really crossed over to a dark place, but I had visited the dark place many times. <laughs> Honestly, I knew some pretty shady characters. I mean, the... It could have happened, very easily have happened that we would have run into each other or had some kind of encounter together. So I feel like I really dodged a bullet and I'm thankful that I'm still here to tell the tale. Okay, this is creepy. I finished recording the episode for Kevin Lee Graff and I was in the midst of editing it for this podcast. And this is the story that happens. I go downstairs to take my dog for a walk. And I'm in the park. Okay. And I start talking to a woman. And she says, gosh, it's cold outside. I'm from California. And I say, oh, wow. I used to live in California, too. And I said, yeah, it would be cold if you're just here from there. And she said, yeah, we've been here for a while. But, um, you know, which part did you used to live in? And I described where I lived, which I mentioned earlier in this podcast and she says oh that's funny i used to live just north of sunset in the little you know tree-lined streets there in that neighborhood in hollywood and she describes the neighborhood where the murders of kevin lee graf took place and i said what i said honestly so we were neighbors and we lived there at the same time me and this woman who is now my neighbor again in toronto bizarre so she says to me, you're not going to fucking believe this. She says to me, we had to move away from that neighborhood. And I said, oh, why? And she said, because my neighbor was murdered. Let that sink in for a moment. I'm literally editing a podcast on Kevin Lee Graf. I go outside and I run into a woman who lived next door to Robert Lee's and that's why she had to move away and now she she lives next to me again years later and in a different country so I'm going to share with you some details that she shared with me that I obviously would not have been able to find doing research because these are very personal details and um and the reasons why she's still alive today. Uh, so here we go. So she told me that, first of all, she used to see Robert Lees walking down the street with his girlfriend all the time. She calls him Bob. That's how well she knew him. Um, she said she would see them all the time. He was a lovely man. She said they had been dating for about 20 years 
but never moved in together. She just lived eight houses away, the girlfriend of Robert Lee's. Eight houses away. And on the day that Robert Lee's was murdered, he had a cold, apparently. And so that's the reason why his girlfriend didn't sleep over that night. Had she slept over, she would have been in the house when Kevin Lee Graff entered. So the night before, allegedly, she said to Robert Lee's, Hey, you're not feeling well. You go to sleep. You have a big day ahead of you tomorrow. Because the next day, as you will remember, Robert Lee's was being honored um, in Beverly Hills for his work. So she decides to get give him space, let him rest. So she goes home, and then he goes in his place. He was known for not locking the door. I don't know if it's something of his age, from a different time. It's a quiet neighborhood. He was known for not locking the door. So now we know that the door was unlocked. So lock your doors, folks. So the woman I spoke to, who is now my neighbor, let's give her a name, Tina. So Tina tells me that she wasn't home the day that Kevin Lee Graff paid her neighbors a visit. She was out of town, thankfully. And not just out of town. Are you ready for this? This podcast is called True Gay Crime. This could not be a gayer reason for her not to be in town during this crime. She was in Washington, D.C. for Gay Pride at a Madonna concert. It doesn't get gayer than that. She told me, Tina told me, that Madonna saved her life. Because had she not been, they specifically went to D.C. for the Madonna concert. It just happened to also be Pride. She told me that the only reason they were out of town was for the concert. Had Madonna not had that concert that night in D.C., she would have been home with her husband, not only that, here we go. At the time of day that Kevin Lee Graff paid a visit to Robert Lee's, at that time of day, Tina and her husband were usually in their backyard having coffee and listening to their morning radio shows. So they would have been sitting in the backyard. Their fence was the adjoining fence to these victims two properties they would have seen kevin lee graff hop the fence carrying robert lee's head but they weren't home they were in dc at a madonna concert during pride when they came home it was all over the news the houses are taped up of course, they heard about it before they came home because it exploded all over social media and their friends knew that they lived in the neighborhood. So they were contacting Tina and her husband and telling them what had happened to their neighbor, their next door neighbor. So when they got home, everything is taped up. There's cars everywhere, the whole, the whole deal. There's blood on the fence still from the crime. Tina also tells me, that Dr. Engelson had a dog, which I did not find in the research, and that Kevin Lee Graff, when he entered Dr. Engelson's house, which was the second victim, as you remember, who was on the phone with Southwest Airlines, Kevin Lee Graff kicked the dog in the face, and the dog lost an eye. And weeks after, once everything was cleaned up, the police cars had left, the press had left them alone, the helicopters flew away, Tina would see Dr. Engelson's widow walking their one-eyed dog down the street. So the dog survives, but loses an eye. So thank you, Tina, for helping flesh out some more details to this horrific story. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you in the next episode. If you enjoyed this podcast, make sure to find the True Gay Crime Facebook page and follow us on Instagram 
at True Gay Crime. And we'd love to hear from you. Do you have an LGBTQ crime story from your city? You can send your story to truegaycrime at gmail.com, and I'll share it on a future episode of the show. Did you know you can subscribe, rate, and review True Gay Crime on Apple Podcasts? It would mean everything to me if you did, because it helps me create content you like, and it lets Apple know to share it with more people. Thank you for listening. And remember, always look behind you, lock your doors, tell someone where you're going, and look out for each other. Why can't we all just get along?